morning. Thank you for joining us for beginner beekeeping Q&A. We're already out in the apiary doing some beekeeping and we've got Beeja who's just joined the hive this week and she's never actually been inside a beehive to see what's going on in the brood box. So she'll be asking beginner beekeeping questions and that's the theme of today. And if you've got questions, put them in the comments below because it's all about helping each other learn and it's all about asking those questions you're afraid to ask. Sometimes out there in the world, you can get a bit ridiculed for asking those beginner questions. But here, it's a safe place to ask. We've got a lovely community to help. And if you've got the answer to people's questions, then chime in, help them learn. That's what it's all about. We all started off as new beekeepers once. So questions in the comments below, and let's get into it. Right now, we're just getting this smoker going. So if you just want to put this in here and you can stuff it in. Now I've already lit in this smoker. So you can use your hive tool just to push a bit more fuel in because it's hot and then start squeezing these bellows. And when you squeeze the bellows, what happens is air gets forced in the bottom and up through what is pine needles. Now you can use mulch, you can use leaves, you can use whatever you've got around Give that a good squeeze, good puff, don't be shy. And what you want to see is a good amount of smoke bellowing out here. Now while we're here, let's add a bit more smoke to that. So for those that are just tuning in, it's beginner beekeeping Q&A. Don't be afraid to ask those silly questions. It's all about helping each other learn. So this does get hot. So wear your gloves if you're new to beekeeping. And we're just going to close this now. And keep going with that? Or? Yep, keep puffing it. And keep puffing it till you see nice clouds of good smoke like that. And you can even give your hands a little smoke if you're not wearing gloves. And that hides your smell or your mammal pheromone. I guess we're like a bear or something coming into the hive. And if we smell like one, they're more likely to get a bit defensive. That looks beautiful. So, mate, can I ask a question? Yep. Um, grass, like, is that the best, like, this kind of small, dry grass? Yeah, or, or garden mulch, a bit of hay. Yep. Um, whatever you got around, dry leaves. If you've got nothing else, use some cardboard and paper. But organic things off the ground are usually nicer for the bees. People have their favourites. Sometimes the bark off, off like a tallow wood tree or something like that will keep it going longer than pine needles. Or you can throw a pine cone in as well, just for a bit more, or some wood chip or whatever. But Is there anything you shouldn't use? Uh, don't use like magazines that have like uh, too many toxins in them because that's all gonna come out in the smoke and you don't wanna blow that into the hive. Okay, so now pick up that smoker. What I'm gonna get you to do Yep, is put the mouth of that smoker, and you can hold it just by here like this, right in the front of the entrance. So come around here, and oh look at that, just look at the pollen on the legs of this little bee, it's beautiful. So what you want to do is put it right here, yep. and give it three good puffs like that, and that's all we need to do. Now, it's a good idea just to make sure the smoke is gonna keep going and leaving it near the entrance isn't a bad idea for the returning bees to get the waft of the scent home. We're just gonna get straight into it by now lifting off this roof. So this comes off like that. And what you've got here is the inner cover and some kind of interesting cockroach. <laughs> There's a plug in the inner cover that's used for feeding bees if you need to. But we just put that in. Some people leave that out and let them build up honeycomb up here, which looks like that has happened in the past. Somebody's left that out and there's honeycomb being built there. But it can get a bit of a hassle after a while. Fun at first, but then a bit of a mess to clean up. So next we're gonna get our hive tool. If you've still got it in your back pocket there and then get under that inner cover and just lift it off. 
Yep. For those that are tuning in, it's beginner beekeeping Q&A. Put your questions in the comments. We'll get to reading them out. In the, is the yep. corner or middle? Yep. Corner's perfect. Yep. Just lever that up and off. Oh, wow. Excellent. So, Sorry, can you see? because there's no excluder here between the brood nest and the inner cover, there's a chance that the queen could be right here on the underside of the inner cover. So I'm just having a quick look for her, just in case she's bigger than the other bees, a bit longer. She uh, walks in striding motions. After a while, you get your eye in. She's not usually up here, but sometimes. And because if she was here, and I don't want to orphan her from the hive because she might not make it back, I'm just gonna lean this against the entrance here for the remaining bees to actually crawl because she may not be able to fly when she's in egg laying mode. So it's a good thing to do is just lean that up against the hive so those bees can just walk back in if they need to. So we leave that there and now we're away with our brood inspection. So keep the smoker going. Put this away. Yeah, keep puffing this for a little bit. Get that nice cool smoke first. See how it's starting to go out. Big, ah, yep. big puffs. Kind of like lighting fire. Big puffs. That's it. Good. Excellent. It's great to have somebody who's <laughs> never done this for a beginner beekeeping <laughs> episode. Thanks for joining us, Speedja. Okay. So next, I'm going to actually install our little brood frame rests on the side of the hive. So I'm going to get them from over here and. With this little tool here, we used these last week to show you how to harvest a bit of honey from your flow hive. If you missed that, have a look at the last video. Now next, we're just going to wind out keep going with the these smoke. screws. Yeah, you can keep going. Uh, classic, I've actually got the wrong drive a bit, but I can make it work. Okay, so wind that out to the point at which this can latch on and turn around like that. Should, should be nice and firm, not too wobbly. Adjust your screw to suit. Okay. Again, wrong drive a bit. <laughs> okay. It's about good. I like to go over the keyhole like that and turn it into position that way you can get it nice and tight like that so it's nice and sturdy for a frame rest beautiful nice double use item harvesting honey and a frame rest for when you're doing your beekeeping so yeah you can blow a little bit of smoke in there like you've been doing just right in don't be shy like this and you'll notice the bees get ah, the, get a little bit agitated at first yeah. but it has this calming effect which has been used for for the last 150 years or so in keeping bees, or longer actually. In indigenous tribes, they used to use smoke and climb cliffs and things like that. And it would help calm the bees as they you were- You notice they all go down. Yeah, they clear out of the way, which is super useful too yeah. for, for the next bit. So what we're gonna do is start pulling some of these frames out and actually look at what's going on inside the hive. So grab your hive tool. Mm -hmm. I'll just talk you through how to do that. Meanwhile, if you've got beginner beekeeping questions, don't be shy, put them in the comments below. So, I'm looking for a frame that should come up and out easily, and I think this one will. So first of all, you need to put the chisel end of your hive tool, that's it, between those two end bars. So about there, push it down and wiggle it back towards you and that will push the frame over a little oh, bit. Oh, I see, like lever it a bit. That's it. And the same at this end. And that loosens it up. If you don't do that step, what can happen is the nails pull out of the frames as you try and lift it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Next, turn your, there, turn your tool around to the J end and put the J yep. under here like this. Ah, oh, right. And yep. then actually against the other frame like that. Ah, so that's a lever again. It's a lever again. Now I'm going to hold that for you and now do the other end. 
a uh, bit further towards the, um, it's all new, isn't it? B seat, everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's it? That bit, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now, once you've got that, you can just lift or you can use your swap hands. Mm -hmm. That's it. And grab that end bar with your hand just under here, like I'm grabbing this one. Yep. And they slowly come up. That's it. Now you can put that aside and use your other hand here. That's it. And now just slowly, gently coming up and you can marvel at the amazing world of the bees. Have a look at this. We've got honeycomb here and we've got nectar here. So they are bringing in some nectar, which is a really good sign. The bees have been a bit hungry. We've had months and months. We've had double floods here. The bees haven't been out of forage. We're so happy to see the sunshine and so are the bees. Just starting to bring in some nectar finally, which means hopefully they'll get on a good flow. They'll store some honey in the top box and we can share some too. So this is what's called a naturally drawn comb. And if, you, if you're sick of holding that there like that, you can just rest a corner down on something. There we go. You can hold it there for us. And the bees have done a good job of drawing this comb out. All we put in here is a wooden frame. There's no foundation or wax and wire, and the bees have done this job. Now this has been used quite a bit for brood, and then it's been shifted to the edge by the look of this. I can tell that because of the dark areas, particularly down low where they like to put their brood. They often skip the corners and you can see that's lighter. It's the silk cocoons that build up and give it that dark colour. Beautiful. So the other side's pretty similar. Now, I'm just going to spin it around, just have a quick glance. Unlikely for the queen to be on this frame, but I'll have a quick look anyway before I place this frame aside. The queen's more likely to be in the center. Now you don't have to find the queen every time, but it's a fun game to play. I'm just putting that down right there on the frame rest, and I'm putting it on the higher points here, and that way I can fit three frames if I need to on these shelf brackets. Okay, what we might do is go across and you, you can start levering that with your tool. Mm -hmm. You can, oh yeah, this is your one. And uh, levering it across, we might just move it across to here and grab a frame further in to see if we can see some brood. Meanwhile, are there any questions coming in, Chase? Yeah, some great questions and obviously everyone and loving our weather up here at the moment. And of course, a lot of people in Australia having those full on strong winds. So lucky we are not having them. Um, Seeds, one of the questions came in about the smoker actually and was referring to had been told that you needed to use cool smoke um, on, the, on the hive, not hot smoke. And uh, um, Gary was just sort of saying when he's doing it, he finds that he can never get the smoke cool. Is he doing something wrong? In my experience, you just don't want it hot, like flames coming out and burning the bees' wings off and things like that. You obviously don't want that. So just put, if you want to test it, um, like it's not going to be completely cold, it's coming out of a fire, it's, it's going to be warm. So perhaps the term would be warm smoke. But one technique, if you really want to cool the smoke down, is put some green grass right on top and that will have a cooling effect to, to the smoke. Oh, great. So that's not really hot on your hands, is it, Seed? It's not really hot, no. Warm. I'm just doing this, nice smoke coming out. I would call that cool smoke, even though it's warm. But yeah, if you've got a raging fire in there and flames are coming out, that's obviously we smoke it a bit not a good now thing. Because there's lots of bee activity. Great idea. Oh, no. That's it. So we can add some smoke and it clears the bees out of the way at the point where you're working. Okay. See if you can bring that frame up and we'll have a look what is on it. All right, Trace, any more questions? Yeah, so the Weedy Gardener's tuning in and just wondering, had lots and lots of wet weather, um, but noticed a lot of dead premature bees more than normal around and also quite a large amount of hive beetles. Just wondering, does the wet weather affect the bee's strength or immunity? Okay, nice to have you tuning in, Weedy. 
Uh, and thanks for the, all the uh, great content you've been, been putting out there with your hives. It looks, looks excellent, some, some great tuition for people. And well done on your, your time in the garden, eating off the garden. Now, this one needs to leave, I should have leave it up first before I did that, yeah? Well, you can leave it by putting it under here and just going against this side there, like that. Yeah, it's very sticky, that one. It is, isn't it? I'll do up the other end as well. Okay. Let's pull this one up and out and see how it's going. So yes, there are a lot of beetles around. When the wet weather comes, you do get more beetle activity. Now, there was two parts to your question. You can grab that there. And one was beetles. Yes, lots of beetles at the moment. If your hive is weak, catch those beetles using your pest tray at the bottom by putting a bit of cooking oil in there. Look at that, we've got some brood here in the centre, which is good to see. A bit patchy, but no surprises because it's been a bit of a time where they're throttling down. There hasn't been any nectar for some time with all of these floods. But I'm still looking at this, looking for any signs of issues, looking for perhaps chalk brood, which is chalky little brood mummies down the cells. I uh, can't see any of those, which is good. Also looking for sunken dark capping with piercings in it. Can't see any of those, so it's looking good. But down these cells, even though it's patchy, I can see white shining larvae. So that's the bees in the grub stage. Just like a caterpillar goes through a grub stage, so do bees. And 11 days in grub and then, or larvae, and then they cocoon themselves and then they emerge into the hive about another 11 days later as a fluffy new baby bee. We'll keep a lookout for any emerging bees. Next part to the question was about dead bees. Now, dead bees is normal if you think about what's going on in a hive. Now, a hive might have 50,000 bees in it, right? And to keep up that population, the queen might need to lay up a couple of thousand a day, which means a couple of thousand bees are dying a day, and that is normal. So particularly early in the morning, you'll see the undertakers, which is one of the jobs of, of the worker bee, dragging out any bees that have died in the hive. But if you're getting excessive bees, like a carpet of bees out the front, with their tongues hanging out and dead, that could be signs that they've had a toxic overload of insecticides or something like that. If you're seeing bees that aren't mature yet, as in they're still partway through their metamorphosis and they're looking a bit white, then, uh, yeah, that's one thing we forgot to do was, um, was zip up that bee suit. So if the bees are getting ejected before they're fully formed, then that's a sign, as you say, that hive beetles might be worming their way through those larvae and the bees will detect that and they will actually uh, eject those from the hive and so if you're seeing that then get in there start sorting out any hive beetle issues catching those hive beetles reduce the size of your hive um, and look up some of our episodes on dealing with hive beetle infestations so we've got more brood on this side. I'm not seeing the queen here. So I'm going to put this frame aside also and we'll keep looking. But I'm satisfied that we do have a queen because I'm seeing young larvae down the cells. Did you have a look at those, Bija? Down yeah. the cells, you should see some white shining rubs. Now you need to get the sunlight down there have a look in this area here. You can see one down there, yeah. and down there, and down there. Yeah. So the bees, when the larvae is really young, just hatched out of an egg, will feed those bees royal jelly, which they excrete from their bodies. It's a bit like mother's milk for the bees, right? So they don't cap those ones, they leave them open? Open for 11 days. Oh, sorry, I missed that bit. <laughs> and then three, um, three days in after feeding royal jelly, they start feeding them bee bread, which is pollen that's fermented into a good sourdough. And wow. you'll see some of that around the edges. Another interesting thing I'm seeing on this comb is cell size change. So have a look at the size of these cells yeah. over here. And then compare that to these big ones on the edge. 
So when they're storing honey away from the brood, they like to go a bit bigger. It's a bit more efficient to store honey. And that's why the flow frames are a bit bigger than the brood size cells. Now, also, they'll use those bigger cells for drone brood, which we're not seeing any on here. The drones are the male bees. Is this one feeding? Is that what he's doing right now? Uh, no, they're just t down two adjacent cells there mm. and um, getting on top of each other. But Oh, that one down the cell, yeah, yeah two, two heads down the cells. Well, there's a few things they could be doing. Let's have a look down there. Let's have a look down there. So, this one, yeah, these ones just here. Yeah. Well done, you've got a good eye for what's going on. So there is eggs down those cells, tiny little grains of rice uh -huh. that, that if you wear glasses, you'll need glasses to see. And I can see some bee eggs. So again, I'm satisfied that we've got a nice laying queen in this hive. There's no issues I'm seeing. Um, and not sure what the workers were doing, but they could be feeding them a little bit of royal jelly as that uh, egg is just hatching because as you've got a tiny little, little larvae coming out of an egg, they need to feed them straight away. Super cool. Any more questions, Trace? Yeah, there's a few. Martin's, um, he's a bit keen. He's really worried. Um, hive mate, and there's a couple of callers actually coming in about the wax moth cedar. And Martin had heard maybe mint. And a few people are asking what's, they obviously didn't watch your myth buster with the banana. Um, best way to get rid of wax moth. Okay. Wax moth is, um, not the banana skin one, that's oh. chalk brood. Oh, that's right. Uh, See, obviously I wasn't listening. <laughs> the, um, so wax moth aren't an issue in a hive because the bees won't allow wax moth to get in and destroy your hive, right? But they're an issue outside the hive or if you're storing some frames or if your colony gets so weak that the wax moth can move in. Now, if you've got wax moth breeding up in the tray below, just clean all the wax debris that's fallen through the screen out and you should do that every few months or so just to clean out that wax and that will give the wax moth nothing to feed on. Now if the wax moth are infesting your hive you've got another problem and that's that your bees aren't strong enough to defend themselves so they'll be slowly dying out if the wax moth are getting into your hive. At least that's true for our area. Now, I guess it could be said that in a cold climate where your bees are shrinking down into a bee ball and moving around the hive for the winter, um, perhaps wax moth could infest part of the hive, but I'm not sure. So if you do know the answer to that, chime in. In cold climates, do wax moth actually get into a healthy hive? Generally, it's a secondary problem. So get into your hive. If the wax moth are actually infesting your hive, your colony is dying out perhaps they're queenless and, that, and the colony's shrinking, perhaps they've got a, a, a disease issue, perhaps you've got a queen that's really not laying very well. You need to get in there, find out what the problem is and rectify that so your hive can get back on its feet again. Generally wax moth are just a problem if you leave some old frames around in the shed and they get in there and make a mess of them. Oh great. Cedar, just back on, uh, Weedy's come back in again, just saying that he has got the tray full of oil, but it's like the bees aren't pushing the hive beetles out. Is that a problem? Uh, not really. If your colony's nice and strong, uh, just open up the side windows. If you've got lots of bees in your hive, then don't worry about a few beetles running around. The bees will keep them under check. So it's about... Um, when your colony gets a bit weak, then you really need to do something about the beetles. Great. Tizza, who's a real regular here with Facebook Live, just wondering needs to feed the bees here in Australia and just wondering what's the best option for feeding the bees with the flow hive? Okay, so on the inner cover, which I left in front of the hive, the, there's a, a hole in it here, all right? So what you can do is pull that plug out. Now the bees have waxed it nicely in, but what I'm gonna do is lever that plug out and show you what's underneath there. It's just simply a hole. Now that can be used to feed bees. You can get a nail and 
punch a bunch of holes in the lid of a jar, fill that jar full of uh, sugar syrup. Now you're probably going to go two to one sugar to water for a nice thick syrup if you're feeding for the bees storing. If you're feeding to activate them to lay brood then you'll have a, a thinner syrup, probably one to one sugar to water. Put that in the jar after cooking it up and dissolving it all, letting it cool down. Turn the jar upside down with the holes here and the bees will then be able to eat some of that and serve themselves. It doesn't flow in out of the holes on its own, they have to suck them out because of the airlock that's created when you turn the jar upside down. Now if you want to put a big jar, like a tall one, you can do that, but you'll need another bee box between here and your roof to uh, make sure the jar and any, any uh, sugar syrup that spills out isn't exposed on top of your hive. Look up making a quick and dirty feeder on our <laughs> YouTube channel or our Facebook feed and you'll see a few other options as well. An easy one is a Ziploc bag, put the sugar syrup in it, poke a few pinholes, just put one here, one there and the bees can come up if you take the plug out and serve themselves as well. And there's also round top feeders you can get which will fit here, they almost fit under the lid, good enough, which you can use if you want to. Okay. Right. So they went away when they were smoked and now they will come back. So we're smoking again? Yeah, add a little bit more smoke again. Let's pick up another frame while we answer the next question. Some great questions coming through. Beginner beekeeping Q&A. Don't be afraid to ask those beginner questions. And if you know the answer, help out. Chiming in on a thread, that's what it's all about. Great, well here's a good one, see, that's sort of like Battle of the Bees. This is Jeremy saying, had a six week old nuke installed into the flow hive and it was going great, like eight out of the ten frames were full. Um, added the super a couple of weeks ago, lots of brood and eggs, everything going really well. Found the queen twice, she was looking great, everything was fab. Was doing an inspection today and found the workers bailing the queen and her squealing. I rescued her in a box. I also found a capped queen cell and a few empty. Do I put her back in and let them kill her? Oh, wow. <laughs> I well, know. First of all, congratulations for getting so into your beekeeping and noticing these things. That's a, a really, really good effort. Now, I think in this case, leave it to the bees to, to decide. If, if they want to bail up the queen, knock her off and raise a new one, then they're probably doing it for a reason. And you should probably allow the bees to do that. Um, I mean, they may or may not be. Typically, that sound you're hearing is a war cry, actually, and she'll go and sting the new queen before she's emerged out of her queen cell. So what happens is she pipes, so it's like a tooting noise or sometimes a bit of a growling noise. So she makes that noise and then she waits for a response from any other queen cells around the hive. She'll chase them down and sting their queen cell and kill that queen before it emerges. So that's normally what it's about. Now queens usually have an entourage around them, so that might be what you're seeing. You've seen the queen running around, a lot of bees piling around her. They can behave like that. It's, they're, they're the escort bees <laughs> and they're, um, they're, they're following the queen around. Now look here what we've got here. If you bring the camera down, you've got one bee feeding another bee. Ah, they got camera shy and just stopped. Bees when they collect nectar, right, they, they don't fly back and deposit it into the cell themselves. They actually fly back from collecting that nectar and pass it on to a receiver bee who then goes and put it in, puts it in the cell and that bee being a forager bee can get back out, continue foraging and do some more flights that day rather than getting bogged down in the chores of the hive. So the worker bees go through many jobs in their short life of four to six weeks but uh, packing honey in cells is one of them and foraging is one of them. Now here you've got some lovely brood. I love it when it's like clockwork across here like that. And then over here, you've got brood that's sticking out, like a bullet shape. Yeah, out. I've got that on this side as well. 
So they're the male bees, they're the drones. They're bigger, so they need a bigger cell. So firstly, they'll choose a cell, the queen will measure it and decide whether it's big enough for worker, for a drone brood. And then what she'll do is lay an egg, but not fertilize it. She can choose at will whether she fertilizes an egg or not. If she doesn't fertilize it, it will be a drone. Here's one here, big drone. Now, drones don't have stingers, right? So the good ones to grab and show off with the uh, children. Now, see the eyes, they're bigger than the worker bees and they touch together in the middle. See that? Now that's often, as you get started in beekeeping, you can tell, and if you look at a worker bee, their eyes are smaller than that. Can you see that, Bija? Yeah. And their bodies, it's gonna, it's gonna run off as soon as I let it go, but their bodies are much bigger. See that? And uh, they're kind of teddy bear shaped instead of being more elegant, I guess. And the queen has, is a, a worker bee that's been supersized. Same genetics as a worker bee, but she's fed royal jelly for her entire gestation of 11 days. She turns into a queen and her body is longer. Now we haven't seen the queen yet, but right here in the middle of the brood nest is where we might see her. I haven't been particularly looking hard, but I'll keep an eye out anyway. Any more questions? Yeah, Craig's uh, tuning in from Exmouth, Western Australia. Um, I've been a supporter since the Kickstarter, which is always amazing to still hear from. Um, got a swarm about eight days ago, and the swarm's in the brood box, and they're making nice honeycomb, the queen's laying eggs, everything's going really well. So a couple of questions. The first question is, noticed at night the bees seem to be bearding out the front of the hive. Is this normal? Fantastic. Thanks so much for chiming in. Everybody that helped us get started in the beginning, it was a massive groundswell on a global level. It's just unbelievable how, how many people wanted to, wanted to uh, help us get started with our flow hive and keep bees and harvest honey in this new way. Now, it is normal for your bees to beard out the front. That's a sign that they're really healthy. And it's time then to, to, to if they're in a, a, a nucleus, you would put them into a box that's bigger, like a brood box. If they're already in a brood box and they're bearding out the front, you can put a, another box on and if they're building up to the point where they're still bearding then just have a look it might be the hot weather or it could be that they're getting overcrowded now if it's hot weather you'll see them bearding out the front but when you open the side windows you'll see there's not many bees in there and that's normal they're just getting out of the way so they can get the airflow going now if they're crowded in there you open the side windows they can hardly see the combs and they're bearding out the front then that's a sign that they either need more space or they're gearing up to swarm. Now, if they're gearing up to swarm, uh, it'd be a good idea to get in there and take a split by taking half the brood frames out into a new box. And that way you don't have to hang around waiting to catch that swarm. So you get ahead of the curve, you take a split from that hive, that alleviates the congestion. And that's the main problem or, or the main trigger, I guess, that causes the bees to swarm is not enough space to lay in the brood comb. Other things you can do if you don't want to take a split is you can actually perhaps cut some honeycomb out from the edge frames that are usually honey, move those empty frames back to the center and uh, probably put a frame in between. So check board it a little bit, take one from either side it's a good thing to do in spring as your spring management. Look at that, Beeja's first time beekeeping <laughs> here. She, so she's good. She's got it, she's got it. Amazing stuff. Now she's just got to spot that queen. Yeah. Come on, Beeja. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's oh, right. I can see a fat one around here. Okay. Is it a drone or is it a queen? Does she have a pointy bum or does, is it more teddy bear shaped? Um. I lost it. Okay. Now a lot of bees on this yeah, it's frame. Amazing. So nice and healthy. And Oh, so teddy bear is drone. Yep. I think it was a drone. Eyes touching together in the middle. Yeah, that's a drone. A big, big fat drone. 
Yeah, so we don't particularly need to find the queen, but it's just fun to. Look what we're getting here. This is called festooning, where the bees are hanging on to each other. And they do that for scaffolding when they're building comb. But they're basically hanging on to each other. I'm going to put my hands right in here and show you. The bees are just hanging on, hanging on. And these bees are friendly, so I'm happy to go gloveless and put my hands in here. But if you're new to beekeeping, wear your gloves like Beeja is. Because it takes a little while to get to the point where you can move in, in, around the hive without um, putting your finger on bees and getting a sting. Okay. Beautiful. Wow. That's a, and the, the rest of Craig's question, uh, Cedar, was also how much is too much in inspecting the brood box? And a couple of people have asked the same question. Okay, so don't be afraid to get in there often. It's all about learning. It's wonderful if you're so excited to get in there to have a look what's going on, check their progression. Every time you go into the hive, you'll see something, you'll learn, you'll ask questions, you'll find answers, and that's what it's all about. Now, having said that, try to choose days that uh, are warmer. You don't want to chill the brood. Now, we're, we're first day of winter here in the Southern Hemisphere. We've got the brood sitting out. It is a bit cool. We might start putting the hive back together because you don't want to chill the brood. Now, brood that's capped like that will be fine, but when you've got larvae, the uncapped brood, they can suffer a chill on a cold day. So it's more about when the, if you're inspecting often, choose nice, warm, sunny days, mid-morning to mid-afternoon is ideal. Now, another thing is when you manipulate your frames, do it nice and gently, Try not to squash bees because a danger of inspecting your colony is you might actually squash the queen and that will set your hive back a bit. Hopefully they can raise another one. Uh, but can happen sometimes in busy colonies where you accidentally squash the queen. I have a question. When we put them back, do they need to go in the exact order that they were in before? Perfect question. Now the answer is no, but if you if you are putting them back in a different order, be careful that there's not a protrusion on a comb that's touching another piece of comb because the bees then can't service that bit until they chew it all away. And that's where, if you've got hive beetles in your area, they'll take the opportunity to lay there while the bees aren't chasing them around. And then you can, that can be the start of a colony actually, what's called sliming out, where the hive beetles get a hold and start laying lots of eggs where the combs are touching together. Here the combs are nice and straight. They've done a great job of drawing this natural comb. So you could put them back in a different order, but it's nice to put them back in the same order. So I, I remember how they went. Yeah. Do you want to have a look and see if there's a queen? I can have a quick look here. I don't think we'll go through the entire hive looking for the queen this time, because it might be time to start putting this hive back together. Any more questions? Yeah, Kathleen is caught tuning in from freezing Canberra and just wondering how the, um, she could insulate her hive. Okay, freezing Canberra. Now, my grandfather lives in Canberra and he's got hives there on his balcony. He's got them on his farm also. And he had a hive outside the window for four years running that didn't even have a box at all. It was hanging on a branch, it just built its comb. Bees will do that sometimes. I see it from time to time, where they just hang on a branch with no box around them. And they were fine, they survived the Canberra winter. So you'll be surprised that bees are very hardy to the cold. And it's controversial whether you should insulate your hive or not. So I probably wouldn't bother in Canberra, but ask some local knowledge and see whether other people are insulating their hives or not. Uh, this is beautiful. Look at the size of these cells. This is amazing. Massive cells here, big drone sized cells. So if they want to uh, make some more drones, this corner would be good for that. We've got honeycomb in the corner here. You can see the difference here between honey which has been capped off with the capping on top. Brood over here, which the cappings are just a little less see-through there. And then empty cells here. Okay, let's start putting the hive back together. 
it does no. it. <laughs> bees all over me. Now, see how there's bees all over where you want to work sometimes? Smoke. Add a little smoke there and, yep, puff, puff, and that end. Now I'm holding the frame over the hive just in case the queen is on here. I'd rather her drop into the hive. She falls on the ground, she might get stood on, she might not make it back into the hive. Beautiful. Now that can go straight back in like that and this frame went here. Now you don't have to put them right close up yet. We'll squash them together uh, in a minute as we progress the last frames. And the next one was here. If you could pick up that with your hands on the edges, up. yep. The next one goes in. Champion job. Yeah, Look at this, first time beekeeper. She's not really <laughs> concerned at all. She's joined the hive this week. Fantastic. Yeah, and lots of people loving that we've got a new time beekeeper because there's a lot of new time beekeepers tuning in. So it's kind of perfect timing. Great, honey brood. Look at that beautiful example. This hive's doing well. They just need a bit more of a nectar flow to fill up a super. Okay. Yeah, gloves can get a bit <laughs> annoying. That's why we wear, forget about them after a while. Uh, but there we go. So, so you can use your hive tool just to pull that across like that. That's it. And just stop before you get to the end bars because we'll add a bit of smoke and clear the bees out so we don't squash them. But we'll do that in a minute. Any more questions? Yeah. It happens. So you can just leave that apart. There we go. Yeah, Cedar, um, another new time flow hiver. Kevin's nice. tuning in, getting bees tomorrow, first time, five frame nuke. Any tips and hints for him? Okay, five frame nuke. That's a great way to start. Well done with the nucleus. It's probably the easiest way to start. Get in your bee suit, get your smoker and just have a look at our videos about installing a nuke. Also, if you want an online training course, there's a great one at thebeekeeper.org. Experts from all over the world have tuned in. We put that together. It's also a fundraiser. We're planting a million trees from that, which is amazing. And, uh, but a wealth of knowledge it gets rave reviews if you do want a, an online course. But otherwise, tune in on our YouTube channel, type in those search terms, of, uh, of installing a nuke. And that'll take you through just how to do it. If you are a bit nervous, then, then grabbing another beekeeper, even if they're beginning, can help just uh, calm you as you go through the process of installing your nuke. But it's basically just swap, pulling out frames out of the nuke box and putting them into your brood box. And what I would suggest is putting them all in the middle and then your spare frames that would have come with your flow hive kit put either side. That just keeps the brood nest intact. If there's honey on the outer edges, then you might put a, one of your fresh frames in between, but keep the main brood nest together centrally. And also, another tip, just let, make sure the space is on the edges and the frames are all pressed tightly together. And that is important because the spacing of them drawing comb needs to be correct. If you have big gaps like that, they'll put a massive comb in between and it will be hard to inspect your colony later. Oh great, so now this is a question, it actually came up in the office the other day and there were all different answers as you always say, it depends who you ask, let's see what you're going to say about it. Um, uh, new beekeeper and wants to add another brood box, a brood chamber, is it better to put it on top of the existing brood box or below? The answer, like many things in beekeeping, is it depends. <laughs> and what it depends on is if you're drawing natural comb, then, and you want to put just a whole box full of empty frames on, you'll want to put it below. That's because the bees are more likely to hang the combs down from the frames. You put it on top, they might come up and start building wonky comb from here in the box above, which might make it hard to inspect. Another thing you might like to do is checkerboard it. So get half the frames out of this box, half the frames, half the new ones back in, and every second one will be a new one, and shift the existing every second one up to the next box. So if you want to go on top, you're using naturally drawn comb, 
then you would checkerboard it. If you don't want to checkerboard it, then the box goes underneath. If you're using uh, foundation, either plastic or, or uh, wax foundation, then it doesn't matter, could go above or below. Lots of information there. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great, Sid. I'll refer everyone now who rings up to watch this Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Tim's saying, recently noticed some robbing behaviour, so put the entrance reducer on, which seems to have sorted the robbing out. Should he leave it on? The bees seem happy enough, and it's been on a month. Okay, so it, it depends. Bees will be fine with it on even year round, but as they get a lot more bees, it will help them a bit to take the entrance reducer off. We generally don't use them here. We don't have that many robbing issues. We don't have really cold times, but uh, people in cooler climates tend to use them more to one, reduce robbing when there's been no flowers for a long time. And the other one is just to reduce the size of their entrance, which will help them keep away things like wasps and mice. We don't have those issues here either. Great, and great, um, we've got Callum behind the camera today doing some awesome film work there. Okay, let's put these bees together. They've been very well behaved, but it's probably time to close them up and put the lid back on. So to do that, we've got to put our last frame in, but there's not quite enough space to do that. So we need to squash these end bars together and the bees are in the way so if we add a bit of smoke but our smoke is almost gone out so I'm gonna to have to puff it for a while to get it going again there we go you want nice smoke like that coming out still nice and cool and I'm gonna add a bit to these end bars and what happens is the bees will clear out of the way and we can start pulling those frames across. You want to do that with the J-Tool? So seizing the opportunity while no bees are in between, that's it, perfect. And the next one. Keep going till it touches, good. And the next one. Now, we'll start on the other end too. You can see this is leaning over a little bit, but we'll fix that up in a second. So now we're on the other end. Same thing, just pulling them all across till they touch. Do you ever want to clear this waxy stuff off there? That is uh, you can, but at this stage it doesn't matter. They've already drawn out the comb and um, bees will be bees and put wax and propolis everywhere. I tend to just leave it. I just want to seal a bit. So you notice that one's on an angle. Mm. If you have a look down from the top here, yeah. Callum, you can actually see that th this frame's on an angle. Now, to fix that, you can do one of two things. Just drop a frame down, which will push it across, or you can actually get your hive tool down like this and, and, and lever off an adjacent frame, and that will push it back into position like that. And you need to go fairly far down to do that. And that will straighten up your frame. So I remember that this one went over here and this one was the first one we pulled out, which happened to be the edge frame. And if you forget, sometimes these tell the story at where there's wax adjoining. Um, a little bit hard to tell this time though. So this one goes across like that all the way levering it across and let's put the last one in well done first time beekeeper here doing a fantastic job um, no pressure on camera live first time beekeeping <laughs> and in the box we go it's been beginner beekeeping Q&A. Thank you so much for all your amazing questions. If you've got answers to people's questions, tune in. Probably got time for one more, Trace. Yeah, fantastic. This is from Fabian um, in Melbourne. Recently got the flow hive ready to go. Um, just wondering when's the best time to, to get a nuke and to install it into their hive. Should they do it the month before spring, for example? 
or wait till spring. Okay, in Melbourne, wasn't it? Yeah, in Melbourne. Melbourne, you're probably going to be waiting for spring, but as, as is a good idea, ask for some local knowledge there. Here, we could definitely start in the last month of winter because the bees are really responding to the flowers that seem to flower in the last month of winter around here. Lots of flowers, so we'll even be splitting hives in the last month of winter here. In Melbourne, you might have to wait till uh, spring to do that in store. Um, and that might be the best time to do it because you've got lots of flowers ahead. So, so that would be the absolute best time. Having said that, ask around, see what other people are doing. So we've got that across. Notice we've got some space on the edge. Leave the space on the edges of your hive like that. And that way your frames are all pressed together. The spacing's right for the bees. They're really fussy about spacing. If you make it too wide, they'll start building all sorts of random comb and it's hard to inspect later. Okay, bit of smoke. Bee just already got that inner cover ready. If I add a bit of smoke, those bees will clear away. You can even just flick away the last ones like this. And what you're trying to do is seize the opportunity so you don't squash any as you put that lid back on. That's it, good timing right now. And there's one there, good, good. And I have the, that's it, good, perfect. And I have the plug here, I'm going to put the plug back in. I'm not feeding them and I don't really want them to build comb in the roof. Perfect. And the lid goes back on and we're away. We can take these little shelf brackets off, it's better not to leave them in the weather. So we'll take them away and get any bees that are landing on the top away because we don't want them stuck up in the roof. Which is the front? So I mean, no, sorry. the back has this cutout here for the harvesting, but it doesn't really matter when it hasn't got the top box on, it could go either way. Beautiful. Just drops over like that. Thank you very much for tuning in. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next time and same time next week. See you then.